Okay, just we'll get started. Hi everyone, welcome. My name is Alexa Finn. I'm the Education Outreach Coordinator with the Alliance. Thank you so much for joining us to the Alliance's February webinar. I'm so happy you could all make it here this afternoon. Um, we are incredibly grateful to have uh, Chris Sarabia with us today. Um, he is from the California Native Plant Society and will be presenting on getting to know the California Native Plant Society. Um, as we uh, go through the presentation day, please feel free to add any questions that you have to the chat um, and we will answer those at the end. And with that, I'm going to pass it over to Taylor Parker, who is our forestry program director to introduce Chris. Hey, thank you so much. All right, welcome everyone um, and happy last day of February. Uh, my name is Dr. Taylor Parker. I am the Forestry Program Director for the Sierra Nevada Alliance. It is an absolute gift for me today that I get to welcome and introduce uh, Chris Sarabia as our speaker. I've had the honor of knowing and working with Chris for pretty much the entirety of my career in conservation, almost 20 years. Um, he and I worked on the same wetland restoration projects when we were both starting out. I would like to believe that Chris and I have kind of a similar conservation ethic, um, but my favorite parts of knowing Chris are where we've disagreed. This has happened uh, several times, uh, most recently at a conference that we uh, spoke back to back at. And each time I walk away after hearing Chris's perspective on things, thinking, how could Chris be so wrong? But it is only with time and serious reflection that I realize, ah, oh, this man is right. And I need to actually put some time to revisiting my own perspective. And that kind of engagement has helped me to become a better conservationist, um, a better um, thinker in conservation, and has really informed my own practice and the work that I do. So I'm incredibly grateful to him for that. Chris has a very important story, um, uh, one that I, I really hope he gets to share, that he shares today. He also has very important perspectives on conservation that are guided by his long history of doing, doing the work, doing the legitimate frontline activity uh, in conservation. And it is to all of our benefit that he has become more of a leader in um, conservation in California. In addition to so many different social justice, community and conservation projects that Chris has led or been a part of, Chris is currently the conservation director for the Palos Verdes Peninsula Land Conservancy. And for the last two years, he was also the president of the statewide organization that we all know and love, the California Native Plant Society, which he's gonna talk about today. I am very excited that Chris accepted our invitation for him to speak today. Uh, I think all of us on the Zoom will have something um, to learn but also, like I always do, um, walk away with inspiration and a um, challenge to our own preconceived notions on, on how the world works. So with that, thank you, Chris. And go ahead and take the mic. I'm gonna mute myself and we get to listen to you now. All right, uh, let's see here. Can you see that? Okay, thanks Taylor, thanks for those kind words. Um, we'll probably talk about it after and probably disagree on some of that. I don't, I, I try to keep it humble. I don't, I don't, uh, I don't think I have too many uh, different, um, I guess, viewpoints to share. But anyway, I, I'll talk a little bit about that in today's presentation about my background, where I'm at, what I think, um, and, and I'll talk a lot about the California Native Plant Society because uh, I was, you know, pretty much in the in the trenches for for two years as a as the president and um, and another four years on the state uh, board there. And so uh, there's a lot going on in California's environment um, and CNPS is is on the front lines. And so right now I'm just a volunteer with uh, the, the California Native Plant Society. I only represent myself, uh, but uh, I still serve in many capacities as a volunteer with CNPS, right? And so, because that's my my love and passion. Um, I'm down here in Los Angeles, as Taylor mentioned, I work with the Palos Verdes Peninsula Land Conservancy, and um, we we manage a, a lot of land in that area and, uh, and, and do very 
localized work. Um, I'm also the vice president with the South Coast chapter of the California Native Plant Society. And so I'll, I'll explain a little bit about um, how these chapters work and uh, how it's all kind of intertwined and connected. And uh, feel free to you know, throw, throw questions in the chat if you're not familiar with the Native Plant Society or if you wanna get more involved. Um, and you'll hear me repeat this over and over. Please, please reach out and get involved. That's how how we work. We're a very volunteer based organization. So, so with that, I'll get started. Uh, the the mission of CNPS is to conserve California native plants, their natural habitats, and increase understanding, appreciation, and the horticulture use of native plants. And so we we do envision a future, right? We're working towards something. Um, and I won't read all of this just because it's a mouthful, uh, but you could read it later or you could see it on our website. Um, but we do um, envision a, a society uh, where people support the mission of CNPS. And basically, this is what we're working towards when we do education, when we do plant science, the advocacy work that's being done, the land stewardship, and the native plant gardening, just to name a few of, of the things. Um, we also envision a future where Californians value native plants, the plant communities, the healthy ecosystems uh, as the essentials to well-being of all living things. Uh, living things need plants to survive, right? And so we're seeing this, uh, you know, as as um, as people, uh, you know, get more involved with nature, um, maybe spend their pandemic days going out for a hike because that's a safe thing to do. We're seeing people start to value the the beauty and the importance of a poppy or uh, or the redwoods or whatever is out there that's um, provides peace of mind. And so uh, we're seeing these these um, these visions come to fruition. Uh, but, but our job's not done, right? We're we're still constantly working on this stuff. Uh, the last bullet point at the bottom is uh, we we envision a future where the work we do. Um, uh, influences public policy for native plant protection. And I'll share a little bit about that, how we do do advocacy work and legislation work. And we're, we're winning some of those battles, which is very interesting. Um, so uh, it's, I think, uh, you know, having that uh, pen to paper on legislation is very important. And it, it, um, it pretty much leaves a lasting legacy for protection. And so this is what we're protecting. Look at this beauty of, of uh, wildflowers on a, on a super bloom year. Um, you know, all those are different native flowers. Uh, I wanna say this is a Carrizo plain. Uh, I could be wrong, but you know, this is why we're dedicated to conserving the native plants and the habitats that, that are part of it. The, these natural areas are important. If this was just a barren piece of dirt, it would not support life. If you go and you look at a flower up close here, you'll see the life on it, right? And so that's why it's important. Uh, we're supporting life. We don't want things to go extinct. But we realize that not everyone has access to these areas or can't make it out there. Um, not everyone, maybe even on this Zoom, has been out to, to the Carrizo Plain. And so we also want to increase understanding the enjoyment of the horticulture use of native plants. You know, you can bring these plants home. You can try to mimic it on your 10 by 10 plot and, and still feel that joy, that beauty, and still support life, right? And so it's, a, it's a, uh, an approach to um, the work we're doing. It's an approach to make sure that we're being inclusive of all Californians and the different types of Californians that we, we have. And so we believe that you can restore one, one. Uh, we can sorry, you can restore nature one garden at a time. This here is an El Segundo blue butterfly. I've had the pleasure of working with this butterfly, and it's it's rarity, right? It's it only exists uh, on the coast uh, down here in Los Angeles, and it's on a special plant, uh, the uh, coastal dune buckwheat. And um, we've noticed. If you build it, they will come. Where we plant this, the butterfly shows up uh, in its historical range. So we're working with other groups uh, to try to promote people planting this in their, gar in their garden where it would have been the historical path of this butterfly um, so that they, they will come back and they have that habitat to multiply and lay their eggs and do their thing. Um, we, do, we do think you can do this because we've seen it 
happen and in action. And so I, I've had the pleasure to work with this one, this butterfly and see it in action. So we will continue that horticulture kind of angle um, with CNPS because we know it works. And so we're a mix of people, um, a lot of different types of people. We have scientists, uh, we have gardeners, we have students, uh, conservationists, we have horticulture experts, so many other people that work with the CNPS. And we're all working together for the same thing, to, to save California's incredible native plant heritage. So uh, CNPS is comprised of 35 chapters throughout the state of California and into Baja, California, um, uh, because we're following the California Floristic Province, which is a, a very unique area that doesn't stop at the borderline, it continues down. And so um, we've recently added that chapter and we do a lot of work down there. Uh, throughout the state and outside of the state, we have 11,000 11, members and counting. Um, it, it keeps growing and uh, you know the importance of so many people backing our mission. These are paid members, right? So people are putting their, the money where their mouth is because uh, we have strength in numbers. We're able to do a lot. And with that money, uh, we're able to really have a voice out there. Uh, but really, it's more about the members. It's not even... we. we we don't really make money off the memberships. It's more of uh, people really um, backing us. And so our staff uh, continues to grow and uh, it's that exponential growth of, of quality work, of quality programs that I'll, I'll share uh, with you all. But before I do that, I wanna share that, you know, California is unique. We didn't just start the, the Native Plant Society uh, because we live here because, you know, we thought it was a, a fun thing to do. It's uh, Cal California is a very unique. Um, uh, it's it's in a unique location on the Earth, and so it's one of the the five Mediterranean climates, right? Um, and you can see them here. All the dark spots are the considered Mediterranean climates, and we actually receive the least amount of rainfall. So our plants are really unique. And what's interesting is if you look up uh, invasive species. They're coming from a lot of these areas in the world because these plants are adapted to that Mediterranean climate, but they're able to kind of transplant themselves in California and really take a hold. And so um, we all kind of share that. And I, I actually have heard in Chile, you, you do have poppies being an invasive species down there. So it goes both ways, right? Uh, but we have a, quite a bit of biodiversity in California. So the society was started to really celebrate and protect that that heritage of native plants. Um, our plants are unique in that they rest during the hot dry summer and early fall. A lot of people think they're dead, uh, but they're really just just kind of resting there and waiting for for the uh, winter rains. Uh, so California is special. A lot of people move here. A lot of people like the climate. A lot of people like what we're doing out here. Um, but it's also special for for habitat value. And so uh, we have more native plant species than other, any other state in the nation, as well as one third of our plants are found nowhere else on earth. So very unique. And so when you look at this biodiversity hotspot map, you can see the blue where most of you are at uh, is, is a real hot spot there. And a lot of California is in that darker blue areas, uh, as opposed to the rest of the nation. Uh, you see a little blue down, down, uh, over here by Florida and kind of in the Northeast, but really we have the most. So it's important. It's important for us to save that, uh, those areas or to um, manage them in a proper way, just so we don't lose this biodiversity uh, that only exists on so many places on the earth. And so now I'm gonna get into programs. Um, it's, there's a lot of information out there on our programs. And so I, I'm, I'm not a staff member, um, so I try my best to explain all the different things that our staff are doing on a day-to-day -day basis. You know, they're full-time workers, they're doing so much work. So this is a real high-level snapshot. Feel free to ask questions, but really, if you want to learn more, I'd say the best way is to get involved with us, right? And that's how you can learn more about the programs and actually get involved uh, since we're still heavily run by volunteers, right? So. Um, I'll touch on some of the programs and um, and hope I do a good job, uh, but I'll try my best here. So 
Uh, first program I'll touch on is a vegetation program. And this is one of our longest running programs. Um, and so we, with the vegetation program, we're doing statewide inventory and mapping. Um, recently, I think in 2021, um, there was a large scale mapping of your area in the Southern Sierra Nevada foothills. So, so I think that's in your area. Uh, 712,000 acres were mapped out there. So we continue to, to uh, kind of perfect this mapping um, and, and continue to take an inventory of what's out there so that we know where, where things are, where their, their protection needs to be, where, when we need to step in. And if something is going on, maybe giant development, um, something, right? We, we already have that inventory ready to go and there's no surprises. And so um, this continues on uh, for <laughs> since the beginning of CNPS and into the future. Uh, and so um, something I, I'll take a step back, all these pro programs overlap. So you'll hear me mention things multiple times because they do, uh, all, all the programs are interconnected in some way, right? And so I'll continue on. Um, so the vegetation program, you know, maps places like this, right? We want to know what's down there and you can't really tell from an aerial picture, but so you really got to get down there or you got to do some high level remote sensing or maybe fly a drone in the right time of year uh, to really get an idea of what's out there and, and take an inventory. Um, and also you got to scour all the old historical data that is out there that may show rare plants or something that may have existed back in the day there that no longer exists. So that's, that's part of the vegetation program. And and really getting an idea of, of what's going on out there. So if you wanna learn more about that, especially for the Sierra Nevadas, definitely go to the, the plant community mapping and monitoring page uh, on the cnps.org website. That's where all of this information will be. Um, you can explore more, read, read about it, um, either in a scientific way or maybe in a more informative way. Uh, we try to target all audiences. Um, what you'll find on that website is also the Manual of California Vegetation. Um, if you went to school or if you're a consultant, you probably use this manual. This manual helps um, in, in describing alliances, and this is what you would do to uh, protect the piece of land, is understand what alliance is there and what plants exist within, within that plant alliance, right? And so uh, we're constantly updating this. Uh, recently, there were some updates in last year in 2021, and it's all available online. So I suggest you take a look at it. Uh, it's, it's, it's very interesting to see what, what alliances you have in your area. And um, potentially, you may have to use that in future uh, protections of, of your lands or to try to understand what you're going to go out and see while you're hiking. So I'll jump into the rare plant program. Um, as you know, California is biodiverse, and so we have a lot of rare plants. Uh, so we continue to collect data on rare plants. Uh, I think we all do, right? If, if you're a hiker, if you're into botany, you're constantly uh, keeping an eye out for something that may not be typical. Uh, I, I, the other day, I found a bunch of rare plants in the city of Wilmington, which is highly industrialized, but in an empty lot, there was a couple rare plants. And so we're constantly keeping that database uh, updated um, and, and keeping it sharp, keeping it um, just, just handy too for everyone. So the, the rare plant inventory is available online so that anyone can access it and, um, and, and really get an idea of what, what may exist and, and how to protect those plants if something comes up. Um, we, we keep this inventory up to date, uh, not just individuals like you and I going out there and finding these plants, but we do rare plant treasure hunts. And so even, even though we had a pandemic uh, in, in 2021, we had a 164 uh, plant occurrences looked at. What that means is at some point in time, someone saw a rare plant here, maybe 10 years ago, maybe five years ago, maybe 50 years ago. Uh, we'll go out there and kind of sweep the area with volunteers, either people who are botanists or just college students or, or, or young people with their parents that maybe want to learn about plants. We go out, teach them how to, how to spot a plant, how to do it right, and how to take a voucher, how to do the whole thing, right? And, and really um, sweep an area, see if those plants are still there, and um, see what the next step is after that. But what's important is to get that inventory. So 
into 2022, we were continuing rare plant treasure hunts. If you think that your area where you're working at or where you live at is a good uh, location for a rare plant treasure hunt, um, please reach out because these are community community based and they're very easy to put together um, since it is community based, right? And um, it's important for us to continue to kind of survey areas that may not have been surveyed uh, ever or in a long time. Uh, we're also part of the California Plant Rescue. And this is basically uh, an attempt to uh, make sure rare plants don't go extinct. So uh, a lot of times on these rare plant treasure hunts or, or in other outings, uh, rare plants will be collected. Uh, their seeds will be collected uh, with a permit, of course, and, um, and put into a, a seed bank so that we have that just in case we need to propagate it uh, if that population uh, disappears or whatever whatever may happen to those plants. At least we have a backup of the seeds. We have a genetic uh, sample so we can do something with it later. So this continues on um, and uh, it's, it's, it's actually a collaboration between a lot of different entities throughout California and then part of a larger uh, umbrella network throughout the, the, the world. Um, two other things that are interesting with our rare plant program is a local flora's project. Um, most places don't have a flora. And so what a flora is, is, a, is a basically a listing of all the plants that exist in that area. Um, if you look one up for your area, there may or may not be one. And so what, what we're trying to do is to uh, work on getting those floras out there so that people know what they're looking for in case they're doing a survey or just going on a hike. They have that local flora list. And uh, I think the attempt is to get uh, 41 counties done in the next couple years because it's really important to have these floras and hopefully in a couple years all the floras will be done for all of California with all of this inventory database that we're collecting right we want to do something good with it um, al along with that is locally rare plants project so if you worked with uh, native plants you know that there are rare plants and they usually have a listing uh, uh, some type of um, rarity ranking. Well, that's great on the statewide level, but sometimes there's a, a plant that only doesn't really occur in your county, but is growing there. And so it's locally rare, right? And, and a lot of people use that term that it's locally rare. It may not, be, may not have a ranking, but it doesn't really exist in this county. So we really got to protect this last little remnant of it. Well, we're also uh, collecting that data and making sure that that becomes uh, somewhat of a, a ranking as well, right? That it's documented that this plant is locally rare because of this, this, and that. So that goes hand in hand with the local flores project. And so here's some pictures of the uh, California plant rescue. Uh, you can see the tiny seeds on the right of a, uh, a Circium plant uh, that was collected. Um, and so you know, people are out there doing these hikes and really looking for these rare plants so that we can collect the seed and um, and put it in a in a safe place for later. <laughs> uh, here's the inventory. I just want to show you this real quick. It's recently got a facelift. You can see the old uh, DOS style uh, web website up top. Uh, if you if you're old enough to know what DOS is, and uh, and now it looks great right at the bottom there. And so you can access that. You can look at all the rare plant occurrences and even uh, it links up with Cal Photos even better. Uh, you still, it's, it's always has been, I think, uh, or at least for, for many years. Um, but uh, really the, the website has gotten a facelift with better access to photos. So you can check them out. Uh, even if you don't have those rare plants, you can kind of look at these beautiful flowers of something that um, is potentially uh, on the brink of extinction. So I will continue with these programs, uh, biodiversity initiatives. I'll talk about that first. Um, this is, it's, uh, it's a vague program name, right? Uh, it's always been there, but not named like this. And so um, what that program deals with is, is really genetics uh, and restoration. And we've recently uh, put out the call to hire a restoration manager that will help out in the science-based uh, component of, of restoration throughout the state. Um, so keep your eye out on that and everything that comes with it if you're doing restoration. It's gonna be really helpful um, in many ways, right? A, a lot of us that do restoration, 
uh, there's a lot of information that isn't out there. We're all kind of doing things a little different. Um, so this will be a, a nice um, hub of restoration information uh, for all of us. Something else being worked on is a botanist certification. And so uh, most botanists out there aren't really certified. Maybe you went to school, maybe you took a couple classes and, and you, you're, you can consider yourself botanist, right? You know how to key things out, you know how to, how to use a Jepson manual. Well, um, we put out a certification so that uh, there's more of a, a standard um, for California native plants. Unfortunately, there's no standard at the moment. And so maybe plants aren't being seen or keyed out or areas aren't being looked at appropriately when developments are going to get put in. So um, we do a botanist certification, I believe, twice a year. And uh, if you know anybody who's a botanist, highly suggest they get certified. There's only about 50 in the state and growing. We just did a couple tests. And so I uh, just want to put that out there. If anybody out there is a botanist, I think I, I, I heard that there are a couple. Um, you can become certified for, for California. Uh, I don't know of, of any other certifications uh, around. Uh, after the uh, 2020 fires, we did something called re-oak. Uh, a lot of oaks were burned in those fires. And so um, we went out, collected seed, people sent to seed. The office was full of oaks, oak, uh, sorry, acorns uh, from the oaks of those areas. And um, recently, I think all of those oak trees or oak seedlings or acorns were put back out into the areas that they're supposed to go in. This was an attempt for us to make sure that that biodiversity wasn't uh, changed because people were trying to do the right thing after a fire and just went maybe to the Home Depot and bought whatever trees to plant so that, you know, or the wrong oaks or, or whatever it was. Um, that that maybe they didn't have the right information so we we did a, a whole educational campaign behind it and then also had those oak trees for those areas for them to plant and so i believe all the oaks have been redistributed um, in the right places i'd be curious to see in a couple years how those places look um, and how how the oaks are doing uh, we also long hand hand in hand with that project was our fire followers project and this deals with pyro pyrodiversity so really after a fire, you get a lot of diversity of, of wildflowers and native plants coming in. Um, our plants are adapted to fire, right? So this was a, an attempt for us to get some, some data on, on fires and post-fire, what happens, what grows. Uh, this was an iNaturalist uh, community-based project, which is pretty cool because anybody uh, in the state uh, could, could join in and just really take pictures and document what they were seeing in some of these uh, horribly burned areas and and so this was really for those wild areas that um that just burnt and really uh, nobody can get out there or it's kind of hard to access now we have data seventy thousand plus observations we involved the community um because we don't have seventy thousand employees to go out there and, and survey even not even half that right so this is community based and using an app like iNaturalist allowed us to really uh get get that quality data have a hub to to collect it and and uh, and and now we can kind of look at the data and see what's growing so i can't wait to see uh potentially a presentation on if there was rare plants uh discovered with this project if uh there's now a database of what plants grow in the uh sorry which plants came come up after a fire in the sierras or wherever it is um now we have that data available to us so as you can see lots of diverse people going out from all all areas of california to do this fun project on a nice saturday afternoon um we also tried to make it fun and and you know had people submit uh memes about rare plants just to just to keep it kind of fun and and um aimed at the youth really uh keep it keep it uh uh, diverse versus just some, you know, piece of paper talking about uh, fire followers that maybe I would have put out because I don't have the skills of a meme maker. Um, okay, so next program I want to talk about is a horticulture program. So the horticulture program uh, is maybe something you're interested in. Um, I'll kind of pop around here. Let's see. So the first thing is our chapter plant sales. So during the pandemic, uh, we we can no longer host plant sales. And so about half of our chapters 
hold plant sales uh, throughout the year so that people have a place to get their native plants, right? They either the, the chapters either grow them themselves or acquire them from different areas. Um, and, and this allows people to have a hub to, to get those plants for their native plant projects. Well, we couldn't you know, meet in person. So we switched to online, which we're all, uh, all my chapter uh, sells plants. We're all gonna stick with this platform because it's a great way for people to do contactless, uh, pick up contactless uh, purchases and still get their native plants. And what we use it for is as a fundraiser for local chapters, right? It's, it's a great source. So we learned a lot. If you're interested in buying native plants, um, go to your local chapter. I'll talk about that at the end of this presentation on how to do that. Um, our YouTube channel. So we, we created a YouTube channel, gathered all these presentations we kind of had in different places and started creating new content as well. So some of the, the stuff we have is called Naturehood Gardening, which re really talks about our neighborhoods and how to do uh, native plant gardening, how to involve the community, all these cool projects and how to do it maybe with the perspective of a, of a, um, a designer in mind, right? So that you can learn some skills while you're there. Uh, Grow Care Everywhere is another video campaign we're doing. So please check out the YouTube and you can see some of these videos for free. Um, I think the Naturehood Gardening was a big hit where we would have thousands of people register and lots of views over time. So um, highly suggest you check that out because they're very informative and something you can just kind of watch on, a, on an evening um, and learn about your native plants or how to landscape or how to prune or how to, how to do really everything horticulture based with native plants. Uh, another project we worked on uh, with partnership with the Long Beach Water Department. So I live in Long Beach, uh, Long Beach, California. I'm really proud of this program because it's uh, basically it, it's a step forward in us working with the different water municipalities on doing plant rebate programs. So one of the programs is the Long Beach Water Department Parkway program where the, the city pays uh, to remove the lawn on your parkway and uh, gives you a bunch of native plants to plant there. Uh, and, and basically they, you know, it's, it's a free program to convert these kind of dead areas of, of, you know, lifeless grass. There's some life there, but not as much life as a native plant would, would uh, foster. So uh, this program continues. We hope to replicate it throughout the state with other water departments, uh, as well as the lawn to garden, uh, lawn to native garden program that the water department also has. So we, we recently put out a, a, a webinar on this, uh, but you can also go to the Long Beach Water Department's uh, website and, and check this out and see how it works. And hopefully you can nudge your water department to do something similar because it's a win-win. Uh, water conservation you know, is, is, is what we need in California. We're in a drought. Um, why not replace them with California native plants and take advantage of the square footage that could, could host maybe the Alsegunda Blue Butterfly that I talked about earlier. So great program, great program to follow and kind of push your, uh, your water department towards. Um, it can be done. Um, a couple of years ago, uh, a CDFA, the California Department of Food and Agriculture, gave us a, a specialty crop, crop block grant. Now, we call it Bloom. That kind of rolls off the tongue a little easier, um, at least mine. And so what, what it is, is basically a, a push to um, get native plants back into landscaping. Uh, you know, you have all these plants that people use in typical landscaping projects. Not all of them are native, most of them are not. Well, we're hoping to push more native plants into landscaping and um, get more, more people involved in understanding how these native plants could work. Um, getting native plants in the nurseries, teaching them how to grow them, doing videos, doing marketing, that's part of this grant. So you may have seen this, uh, it's, I think it's exciting. 120 nurseries throughout California are, are involved and um, we'll continue to, to ramp out more plants that are really great for landscaping, uh, really good for a lot of different things. So um, keep going here. I know I'm running short on time. So Calscape, you may have used Calscape. Uh, Calscape is a great uh, 
website where you can type in your address and a list of plants that are um, appropriate for your area shows up. So check it out. We're basically giving this a, a facelift and you'll start to see those changes. Um, something on Calscape that I recently saw actually someone implement was these garden planners. So uh, maybe you want a, a simple design that can help you in, in, in improving your, your backyard or your front yard. These are available on Calscape. If you haven't checked out Calscape, check it out. It's a fun site, very, um, very focused on your, your average person who may not be a scientist, but has a home, has a yard, they want to do something. Um, let's see, I'll talk a little bit about our education program. This is a, a program that was dormant for a while, so it's being revitalized. And um, with this program, we, we do a lot of grants um, and scholarships to students. And so we're, we're continuing to do that. We do a lot of workshops. So this is where the, um, the botanist certif certification comes in to play a CEQA uh, workshop. So maybe you try and understand how CEQA works, um, as well as uh, other workshops on mitigation, things like that, like that you, you may be in the field and you may need to up your skills. These workshops are offered by us. Best way to learn more is to go to our education program. Um, I want to talk a little bit about Saging the World, which is a, a program started a, a couple years ago um, where we were teaching kids about science, about culture, and about habitat uh, using white sage. And this pilot program started in Los Angeles. Um, look at those kids smiling in, in the corner there. Great program. We hope to replicate it across more schools, um, but this is kind of ramping up and leading towards something we're calling calling saging the world. And so, um, say, white sage. Many of you have probably seen it in uh, popular culture. is used for smudging. Uh, well, there's a big black market for this, and a lot of white sage is getting ripped out of the wild. Potentially, it's going to become a, a threatened species. So we we worked with our indigenous partners um, to create a, a documentary on this so that we can share this, this terrible story that you know, white sage is uh, uh, being ripped out of the ground. And um, potentially, we can use this in the future, continue education, but maybe legislation will have to come into play. School native gardens. So we're also working with, with everyone uh, that works in schools and uh, that does gardening to make sure kids understand what native plants are and use this as an educational tool. And maybe you out there have worked on a school native garden and a lot of people have throughout the state. We wanna kind of unify everyone and, and get everyone um, uh, together on this, this important program that we're all attempting to do, but if we do it together, it may be more effective. And so we're trying to provide a resource and a hub of tools for everyone. All right, and the last three programs I'll briefly share are our campaigns and engagement, um, our conservation program and our publications. So uh, we do have a campaigns and engagement uh, kind of area in, in, in CNPS and uh, this is what they do. They make things look beautiful. This is our Dudleya campaign where mascots were set up uh, of, of Dudleyas throughout the state. Um, this campaign helped to uh, lead into legislation to, to try to protect Dudleyas from um, poaching. And I'll talk a little bit about, about that in a second. But um, this, this kind of interesting approach of making things look beautiful uh, and, and, and almost uh, like an ad um, brings in a different type of person that may not even know what a Dudleya is, but now they're engaged, right? And so we do things like that. Here's the fire follower campaign. Again, this looks like a flyer that maybe at a bus stop, like, you know, a high level ad campaign type of thing, right? But this attracts an interesting type of uh, person. So our, our uh, this, this uh, group of people that we kind of gather either consultants or our staff works on all these cool looking things. Uh, we had a forever forest art contest and that may be something you're all interested in. Look how beautiful this art is on the forest. and. It goes together with protecting forests uh, campaign, right? Bring in the first, bring in the beauty, and then let's talk a little bit more about how we can save it. So you can check this art out on the CNPS website. 
Uh, we also had a 360 campaign where uh, this is to look at native plant gardens from the comfort of your own home. Uh, this was done during the pandemic, so people can still go on a garden tour, learn about native plants, what they can do in their own home, and um, really uh, just, just kind of still be engaged, although not outside, still do it from the comfort of, of their own home. This provides equity and, um, and kind of accessibility for some who may not be able to get out there. And here's another campaign, the Firefax campaign. So a lot of different things going on. I know I'm running short on time, so I'll, I'll continue on here. Um, we do have our conservation conference coming up. So uh, this is done every three years. And we, we're, this year, we, we usually call it the conservation conference. But this year, we're really engaging um, different viewpoints and celebrating conversations that may not have happened in the past with indigenous folk or BIPOC community or getting perspectives outside of the conservation community um, and really bringing in people who love native plants uh, into the conversation. So stay tuned for the, the, the conference. It's in October and um, we'll definitely be promoting and send you all some information on this, this conference. So our publications, Beautiful Flora magazine. So all our members um, get this magazine in the mail. Uh, they also get the one on the right, which is a, a scientific journal. And they're just beautiful magazines. Flora is an amazing magazine that you could put uh, on your on your uh, you know on, on your table, or uh, you could leave it at a a laundromat, and people will read it because it, it's one of those stylish kind of like a Time magazine almost, but of native plants. Uh, I suggest you read it. Uh, we're actually going to start uh, providing digital versions that can be shared online uh, in the future. This is the last one we did uh, in, in the fall of 2021. And this, it was about what the plants the mammoth ate, right? And the, the kind of the paleo theme. Very interesting, right? Talking about native plants and, and all these creatures that are, are no longer with us that what they used to eat. They used to eat native plants, right? Very interesting. Um, Here's a campaign at Native Plant Week is coming up in April and Native Plant Month as well. So we're working on a variety of things for that, but this is kind of like the fun stuff we, we try to put out, try to get people engaged, try to get them excited, make them laugh, but also um, care about these beautiful plants that, that we have uh, in California. And so our last, uh, the last thing I wanna talk about is just a conservation program that does a lot of litigation. We have a lot of breakout groups that deal with either fire or sea level rise or different things. Uh, we're putting out a conservancy advocacy toolkit um, so that your average person can um, kind of take a step-by-step -step, uh, action of how to, um, how to maybe do uh, some protection of some lands in their area and learn about what protections are out there on the statewide uh, legislative angle, um, um, basically a do-it-yourself approach of, of advocacy, right? Um, I know it, it sounds interesting. Uh, this toolkit will come out in a, in a couple months and hopefully um, available to all to use to, to protect lands. Um, so we do do a lot of advocacy and legislative work to protect areas like this, right? And so we've mapped all of this. And right now we're modeling all this. We, we're looking at what areas are most important on the state level and really making sure that we have an idea of what, what's going on there. Um, I'm gonna touch on this real quick. I know I'm kind of rushing through here at the end, uh, but we talked about uh, Dudley poaching. So we did pass a law, AB 223, to make it illegal to remove Dudleyas from state and private lands. That's, this is a first um, legislation that has ever been done for plant poaching. So it sets precedent. We can protect plants um, because these were getting poached. If you didn't hear about Dudley poaching, please look it up. Uh, it was a very interesting um, scenario that was going on throughout the state and we were losing a lot of Dudleyas. Um, so I, earlier I mentioned about diversity. I'll talk real briefly about my background. Um, but that we have a diversity uh, equity group. And so 
you know, CNPS is not, I, I like this quote, CNPS is not devoid of the power dynamics and social injustices present in the US and beyond. The legacies of oppression rooted in cellular, settler colonialism have caused indigenous people, communities of color and working class communities to bear the brunt of environmental harm while being left out of key conservation processes. So CNPS has, um, has a lot of uh, uh, influence on society, though we don't, we don't control society, right? We're a bunch of plant people, um, but we realize that we can work within CNPS to change things. So we're not experts. Um, we, we've con contracted with the Varna Group to help us in creating a visioning and action planning process. The Varna Group is a, a, a group that works with environmental orgs to really uh, assess their, their org in, in their, their equity and their, their DEIJ work and um, change things. Um, we're also contracting with Red Bud Resource Group, which is, which is an indigenous led group that helps in um, um, understanding how we work with indigenous people of California, right? something we, we we lack in and we're really working towards that i hope to share more in the future um with you all as as we uh, continue with our visioning and action planning process uh something else we do is we just have groups meet together um so that they can talk and just kind of have that that bond of native plants um that bond of caring for people and and nature right not just not just plants so we've created different working in affinity groups and we continue to create those. So why do I care about all this stuff? I'm a, I'm a Mexican man, you know, and, and so my background comes from, uh, I come from Southeast Los Angeles. Uh, you, hear, you see a lot of movies about this area, Compton, you, you know, you had a couple of movies come out about that, uh, East LA. And so this is an interesting area where um, majority of people are Latino, uh, half the people rent. Um, most people are around my age, between 19 and 35, and a lot of people don't graduate high school. And so it's a it's a unique area. It's a tough area. It's all concrete. I think the green you see in there is mainly um, golf courses. And so if you don't play golf, you don't have access to really too much greenery. We're trying to change that, right? But this is a this is where I come from. My parents come from Mexico, from Durango uh, in Sinaloa. Uh, it's a very beautiful area. It's on the Sierra Madre Occidental, uh, which uh, some people uh, call the Golden Triangle, which is kind of like in Asia. We get a lot of a um, lot of good weather out there, so a lot of food gets planted out there. Uh, this area has follows this backbone called, backbone of mountain ranges called the American Cordillera. And so very unique, unique area, right? Very similar to the Sierra Nevadas, but in Mexico. And like I said, a lot of food gets grown there because a lot of weather, we got monsoon seasons, a very um, unique place. A lot of people who grow food. And there's my uncle with the 100 year old banana uh, little setup there. A lot of things growing out there, uh, all kinds of food. So you could live off the land. You got to work the land though. Um, and so just like California has a lot of indigenous groups um, in, in the area or, or had, um, they're still there, but there was definitely a lot more people, right? Um, same with Mexico, uh, a lot of indigenous groups there. Uh, my background is Tepehuan and Tarahumara. Tarahumara, if you recall, are some of the fastest runners in the world. Well, in um, back in the day, this guy kind of looks like me, maybe an ancestor. Um, a lot of resource extraction occurred here, a lot of silver, a lot of gold, other precious metals. And so a lot of the indigenous people were either used for this uh, as slaves or uh, cheap labor. And so we lost a lot, right? A lot of resources was extracted, including the forests. And so it's a tough area. A lot of, this is where all your, um, your, your marijuana and your opium is grown, uh, at least on this part of the world. Uh, here I am in a giant opium field, and this is very common out there. Uh, beautiful flowers, but this is what what uh, tends to be growing out there or used to. So it's a very dangerous area, and this is why my family migrated from there, right? Because this is what you would what I would have if my parents stayed in Mexico. I would have been growing opium probably um, if I didn't get out of there. Very deadly, very tough. So a lot of people come this way. Um, 
and we're people who tend to, to tend the land, right? We grow food. We know how to work the land because that's what we did out in, um, in Durango, um, you know, people of the land. And so what I'm getting at, and bear with me and trying to tie this all in, um, is that uh, when a poll was taken of, of, of Latinos, uh, the, the questions asked were, do you have a moral responsibility to take care of the earth, the wilderness, forests, oceans, lakes, rivers? Do you uh, think hiking, camping, fishing, and other outdoor activities are part of my community's way of life? Protecting land and water protects my culture, my family, my community. Pretty much everyone totally agreed, right? It was very limited disagreement there. People care about the land, we come from the land, right? But when asked uh, if they've ever been contacted by an environmental org, three quarters said no, they don't even, they don't even know what Sierra Club is. And so there's a gap there. You know, all those people of the land that have in Mexico and, and, and beyond, I, I talk because I'm Mexican about Mexico, but there's a lot of land out there that is managed uh, in conservation, um, very similar to, to California. Um, so there's this idea that the land was, was virgin land, right? Um, in, in this book, Tending the Wild, if you haven't read it, please read it. Uh, and so there's this idea that, that this was all you know, wild, but no, this land was tended. Uh, there was a connection between people uh, and the land, which is why the land looks so beautiful. And this is the same thing that's going on in Mexico to this day. People are still tending the land you have these different groups out there uh, conserving the land, but also making sure that people are able to live off the land, right? There's a balance that has always been there. People are using the land to survive. They're from it. And so participation is part of the conservation goals of all these groups down in Mexico. Now, it's a different approach from your typical groups out here uh, in the United States, but it's still a uh, conserved land. It's still protected. And what's interesting is, you know, you, you're basically creating leadership out of the community. And that's the board of directors up at the top there of this, you know, this, uh, this conservation group. And there's a future uh, board of directors at the bottom, instead of your typical board of directors here, right, in the US. And so um, same as in California, we can create these partnerships, we can make it, uh, we can make it work. Um, you know, many conservationists are of the leave it alone philosophy. And um, while Native people prefer to properly use the land. And so I'll leave you with this quote, uh, you know, this traditional ecological knowledge represents the clearest empirically based system for research management and ecosystem protection in North America. Um, so what I'm saying is, there's a whole untapped uh, group of people that we're not talking to that are people that highly care about conservation. It's in our blood. That's why I'm doing what I'm doing. That's why I'm involved. And that's where we need to improve on our diversity, equity, inclusion, and justice work, right? Because there's a huge gap there and it's a, a really an untapped resource of people that want to work the land, want to take care, want to conserve and know the connection between people and nature. I will end with just letting you know that you can get involved. Here's Sierra, Sierra Alliance on map on the left, and here's all the chapters of CNPS on the right. You go to our website, you click on a chapter, and you get all the information of how to get involved. This is, this is how you can um, really start to learn more about all these programs we have. So I'll leave this slide up um, and answer any questions, but you can become a member, you can find your local chapter, you can sign up for email alerts, and you can plant your own native garden. Um, here's all the links for that. I apologize for going over on time, but uh, yeah, I'm here to answer any questions uh, with uh, a lot of time that we have. Thank you so much, Chris. I really appreciate uh, your wonderful presentation about working with CNPS. Um, to get involved, we will make sure to share all those links and also you can check out cnps.org. If you are available to stay on for a few more minutes, we will open everything up for a Q&A. Please share those in the chat. Um, but before we get into questions, we invite you to contribute to the Sierra Nevada Alliance to help keep these monthly webinars free and accessible to all. Please visit our website, sierranevadaalliance.org backslash donate if you'd like to pitch in. The website will also be added to the chat. 
And with that, I will start going through the questions that we already have. Feel free to keep you know, adding them to the chat if you have any extras. So Chris, the first question was, what is the protection, if any, if a rare plant is discovered at a site planned for development? So um, there, there should be work, um, sorry, there should be a survey done on these sites before development is done. And so I would, I would contact your local CNPS chapter and see uh, what they know about, because usually your, uh, your local CNPS chapter has a conservation director that is a volunteer and they kind of have eyes and ears on the ground and kind of seeing what developments are uh, going on. And they may be aware of something that's going on that does have a, a rare plant occurrence on it. Um, so you wanna get in contact with them and just check in with them because they will help you through this question because there are protections in place. Uh, all, everything has to be surveyed. They can't just come in and, and destroy a site uh, that is special, that has something on it. Uh, hence why we're trying to map everything, right? And create that inventory. So I would say, um, yeah, in, in short, contact your, your local chapter because there are a lot of steps you can take to protect uh, a plant or even uh, other resources that may be on that site. Great. And another question was, how do we join your projects on iNaturalist? So on iNaturalist, there's a projects um, tab and you can Google, not Google, you can search the, the, uh, the projects there. So fire followers, just type that in and it will pop up. Um, and I believe there's even a couple of rare plant treasure hunts on there that you can look at, uh, but uh, that's how you would join that, yeah. Great. Um, the next question is, what is the best thing we can do if we're renting or like don't own a house to help protect native plants? So if you're renting, you, maybe you want to talk to your landlord and see if they're interested in um, changing the landscape because there's a lot of rebate programs out there uh, depending on where you live. So that might be the, your first step in seeing what your landlord will, will uh, want to do or allow you to do. Uh, but you can also um, plant plants in pots. If you have a little balcony, a lot of native plants do well in pots. So you can start with that if you wanted to uh, do, do something in your own home um, on your own. But if not, there's probably a, a volunteer org near you that um, would benefit from you coming out and helping out with their native plant projects. It, they maybe have a garden or a restoration site, or maybe they're doing rare plant stuff. They may have a nursery. So I would uh, uh, look into what conservation orgs are near you. Um, Sierra Nevada Alliance probably has a nice list of that and they can probably connect you um, with some of those if you're in the Sierra Nevadas. Definitely. And then another question we have is, have you done any podcast appearances where people can learn more about you and CNPS? Yes. Uh, so Pelicanus, uh, Pelicanus is a podcast that uh, I was on a couple months ago. Uh, Cultivating Place was another one. So I definitely checked those two podcasts out. Pelicanus is a great podcast uh, about conservation. So it gives you a glimpse into what other people are doing, not just uh, out here, but throughout the world. So um, you can check those out. Uh, if you Google my name, I think uh, the Pelicanus um, YouTube comes out as well. So some nice visuals on that as well. Great. And that looks like that is the last question we have. And I'll make sure that we figure out a way to share um, how we can ask more questions if you have any. And um, with that, I will pass it over to Taylor. Thank you, Chris. Um, thank you a lot. I feel like I know the California Native Plant Society pretty well, um, but I had no idea the full extent of CMPS work. Um, so that was very informative for me. Um, and I'm very grateful. You know, you use the word uh, beautiful a lot. And with uh, the photos and passion that you share, it's hard for anyone to disagree um, about the, the beauty of California native plants. Um, and habitats. But also as important, I'm really grateful for what you shared with all of us about your personal story and, and your family. Um, and this is what I meant when I, I said, I know you have such an important story and perspective to share. And I really value that you have faith in us in all of us on this call uh, to honor your message and try to incorporate it into our own conservation ethic. I know you've done this with me um, as I was, as you put it, 
more in the leave it alone philosophy and you've helped challenge me and push my own thought process. So um, I'm really grateful for, for your message today. So thank you. Um, and thank you all. Thank you. Thank you everybody for joining us today. Thank you, Chris, for taking the time to teach us um, all uh, more about the California Native Plant Society and the work that, uh, that they're doing in the Sierra Nevada and beyond this afternoon. Uh, so thank you. Thank you, everyone. Really appreciate it. Thanks, Taylor. Thanks, Taylor and everyone on the, on the call. I appreciate you all. Thanks for spending your lunch with me today. Yes, thank you so much. And we will make sure to send out the tape recording um, in an email, and then that will also be posted to our website. Um, please visit our website and set up for our newsletters. Uh, and also check out our social media for any upcoming events and webinars that we might have. Thank you all so much for joining us this afternoon and have a great rest of your day.